Hello and welcome to Analyse This, Mental Health in Film and TV. I'm your host, Dr Boo, and today we'll be talking to Dr Josephine Perry, a sports and exercise psychologist. We'll be looking at the psychology of marathon running, with reference to two comedies which have this focus, Run, Fat Boy, Run and Britney Runs a Marathon. So first, a quick synopsis of these films. In Run, Fat Boy, Run, Simon Pegg's character Dennis is an out-of-shape, unfit, immature man, and he attempts to prove his worth to his ex fiance by entering a marathon three weeks before the race. He'd left this pregnant fiance at the altar five years previously, and her new beau is running in this marathon. So Dennis wants to show that he is just as capable and a changed man from the person who had run away on his wedding day. With his friend and his landlord as coaches, he finds himself running for an erectile dysfunction charity. Uh, well, I, I should probably get a cab. I got a big run in the morning. A big what? A run, I'm training for the Nike River Run next month. The what do you want? What? The Nike River Run? It's a, it's a marathon race along the uh, Thames River. Why would you do that? Brittany Runs a Marathon is based on a true story. Brittany decides to change her life after being told by a doctor that she's overweight and has a fatty liver. She goes from a life of drinking, drugs and unhealthy relationships to being a runner, entering first a 5k and then finally a marathon. Hey man, what happened to you? You're caught in the rain? Oh, it's sweat. I, uh, I ran today. Why the hell you do that? Was somebody chasing you or something? Welcome to JC, sports and exercise psychologist from Performance in Mind. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. So, Josie, as you know, we do these episodes looking at mental health or psychologists or therapy therapists and how they are depicted in films and TV shows. This podcast is a little bit different because I want our focus to be on running. We've chosen a couple of films about running, but I'm going to level with you. Um, I've got an ulterior motive for doing this podcast. So I'm running the Brighton Marathon in September this year to raise money for Mind. Uh, Just giving links will be in the comments section. (laughs) And I'm nervous. I'm, I'm frankly petrified. And I'm hoping that this podcast is going to show me and others in my position what a sports psychologist can do for us and maybe normalize some of this feeling that I have. Okay. So let's start by just talking about you and um, what do you do? How do you help people like me? And why do you do it? Uh, so, yeah, I'm a sport and exercise psychologist. Um, most of my time is spent in sport rather than the exercise side, to be honest. Um, I got into it through my running. So I I had a very grown up city job. I was a communications director for um, lots of different companies. My last company was a big health um, charity. And I went over to Australia to do Ironman Melbourne. And so I'd done lots of my training in London in the pools that my company ran. So they were like nice 20 meter pools full of chlorine, very safe. And I stood on the beach in Frankston near Melbourne where our race was going to start. And the waves were horrific. I was utterly terrified. So just as you feel about Brighton, that's how I was feeling that morning as, oh, my God, I've got to go in there. I don't know if I'm going to survive. And it hadn't helped that everyone was talking about sharks and all that kind of stuff that you get in Australia too. It was like, throw it all in the mix. Um, And I was was really, really nervous. And I'm definitely not sure I was going to go and do this race. Um, And the guy on the tannoy said, just to let you know, you cannot control those waves but you can control how you feel about them. And I don't know if you had a psychology degree, but it was, it was, you know, when you just hear the right thing at the right time, it was yeah. so spot on. And I was like, oh yeah. And I got to the age of 37 without ever really thinking about how my mind could impact my sports performance. It just, I just thought it was by working harder and doing more training. It never really clicked. And it was the first time that I had that kind of light bulb. Well, yeah, there's some kind of connection there. Um, And I got in the water and I did the race. And actually, it's my best Ironman time. So um, it all worked out well. And I got back to the UK and it just set something thinking of like, I really want to investigate this. And I really wasn't loving my job at the time. And I kind of got as far as I could in communications. So it was like, okay, I'm still only 37. There must be something else. Um, So I took a, I left, 
I did a um, conversion course into psychology, thinking, well, if I love psychology, that's a route to go down. But if I don't, it's really helpful to understand behavior change if you're working in communications. Like, it, it makes perfect sense. So I did that, but I loved it. Um, and so I then did the master's in sport and exercise psychology and three years training, um, kind of supervised practice is what we have in our world. Um, and yeah, so here I am. So it started with that love of sport and how do I, how do I face my fears? And now I'm really privileged. I get to do that every single day with the people I work with. That's amazing. And so you do Ironman type events. What what other kind of things do you do what, in terms of your sporting achievements? And So I did dancing actually at school. I did proper stage school brat. So dancing, drama, singing, music um, until I was 18. Um, at uni, I did rowing and sailing, um, mainly because I fancied the captain of the sailing team. There wasn't any kind of love for for a specific sport there was it was kind of teenage hormones more um and then didn't do anything for a while when I left and um eventually it was like doing those 5k's for like race for life type things with friends that got me into it and you've done a 5k so then it's like oh let's try a 10k uh and then I ended up signing up for London Marathon which was 2004 and then I did the marathon and then next on that bit is triathlon and so it just gets longer and longer and longer um so I've done six Ironman races um but I had my daughter four and a half years ago so Ironman training and young children just don't mix Um, I don't want to go out for a six seven hour bike ride on a Sunday when I should be playing with her so since then I've done a couple of marathons um and then some shorter distance triathlon stuff so, but I will be with you on the start line at Brighton because that's my next race. Yay. Well, maybe not in my pen. I'm thinking possibly <laughs> I will be in a slower pen. I'm thinking my aim is to get round uh, as opposed to getting round in a particular time. That's where I'm trying to get my brain to go. And um, because we're going to talk about movies, that was the line I loved most in Brittany Runs a Marathon. Um, it was something like, if I did, you don't have to win it. You just have to finish it. Because in lots of sports, people focus on winning. And most of my job is trying to stop them focusing on winning and trying to get them focusing on being a brilliant athlete. Because the pressure of winning is what stops them often doing well. But in running, I don't know how many of us are doing Brighton, but I'd imagine 10, 15, 20,000. They're big, big races. And there'll be two winners, a male winner and a female winner. That's it. So the rest of us need to be kind of winners in our own right. Yeah. Winners in that we're proud of what we've done and that we've put everything into it. I'm never going to get a trophy. And I'm quite okay with that. So it is for all of us, it's about getting around in a way that we're proud of rather than feeling like we have to go a certain time. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. I love that bit. There was a moment where I think Brittany's talking to one of the runners she's just met and he says he's going to do his first 5K. And she's like, why are you going to do that? You're not going to win. <laughs> it's like it takes some time I think as an adult to get your head around that because there is that emphasis in in school that you 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 do it to win and actually that's part of it's kind of the opposite really that kind of growth mindset that we really hope that children are having in schools where actually it's not about always getting it right and always winning it's about the effort that you put in and it's about the learning curve that you have and I think that that's possibly the thing that changes us when we do start doing these kinds of races, the five Ks, the obstacle races, which were my gateway drug into into running. So I started out with um, a Spartan and then wolf runs and then sort of half mudders and things like that. So I'm, I consider myself an obstacle runner, a a muddy racer, mud queen. (laughs) What I don't consider myself is, is a runner. Although as again, they say in Brittany Runs a Marathon, we all run when we're late for something, basically. Yeah. We're all runners when we have to be. But I quite like the breaking up of the running with, you know, jumping up a six foot wall or going down a slide um, because you get to be a child. And I think that there's something about just running for the sake of seeing if you can get round and seeing how you can do that frees you yeah, in a really. way. I'm, 
I work um, with a few schools actually on with different teams within their schools that are really high performing teams. They want to, they really want to win stuff. And trying to have that conversation with the more you focus on winning, the harder you will find it to win. We've, you've got to focus on just being really good at what you do. But you'll literally be saying that to them, doing a workshop, sitting in a gym where there's like mantras on the walls saying winning isn't everything. Winning is the only thing. And you're like, oh, we're, we're, we're giving all these wrong messages. And, and then the headmaster might stand up in assembly on Monday morning and go, uh, right, upper six did this and this and this at the weekend. They, they won this and they won this. And you're like, you're just reiterating all of the wrong things. And, yeah. and sometimes when you talk like that, you will get people that look at you like, oh, you're one of those soft, fluffy people that doesn't want competition. It's like, no, I absolutely love competition. I'm horrifically competitive. But I'm horrifically competitive with myself yeah. because I always want to be better than I was. I, I don't care how somebody else does that's got different genetics to me, a different body shape, masses of different training. They don't have childcare elements, but they might well have a crazy busy job. You can be competitive with yourself to always be the best rather than having to kind of win over everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think, I think that certainly put me off when I was at school. I really didn't consider myself to be sporty at school at all because because the teachers didn't consider me to be one of the sporty ones. And I think that, you know, that's what happens when you're at school. And and I think it's interesting, those motivations that we then do have to start running. So Catch to 5K has been a big thing. I think it's been amazing. So many people just getting up and trying it. And I think lockdown has probably sort of created a lot of runners that weren't running before there's certainly a lot more of them out there than I've ever noticed in the past (laughs) and I wonder how many of them are now thinking oh you know I could do the virtual races I've loved those under lockdown so I've done a couple of virtual races because I do like a bit of bling I you know that that's I've got to have some motivation I'd like somebody to give me something shiny at the end that that works for me and looking at these two films that we looked at Brittany runs a marathon and run fat boy run um they're both marathon films and they both have though I think quite similar in some ways reasons to start running the marathon they're both trying to prove something to somebody yeah. basically um, and I think what strikes me about I find it really interesting when those type of movies come out I guess real runners can get quite annoyed by them because they don't show the reality of marathon running. I mean, Brittany runs a marathon, she got a stress fracture. I've had five of the things. They, There is a real reality there and there's the whole frustration element, but, but you don't see the nitty gritty of what runners go through when they're training for a marathon. The attention and the focus and the obsession you get with what numbers did you do? How far did you run today? How, are you doing the 10% more? Which trainers are you using? All of those elements, they they partly make that experience and the process of building up to a marathon. And they're what we tend to start measuring ourselves by and the metrics we see as to whether we've done well or not. And I'm not saying that's a good thing necessarily. Sometimes it can be very harmful. Um, and particularly when you've got things like Strava that we're constantly checking and then we're looking how we're doing against anybody else. And then anyone giving us kudos like it matters, but it it feels like it does. Those elements are there for most marathon runners when they're training. And those movies skim over all that kind of stuff. Um, So I think I'd like to one day see, maybe no one would watch it because it'd be very boring when someone's obsessing over whether they did 17 or 18 miles. Um, but But they do skim over a lot of those realities of what it's really like and losing your first toenail and have you done that one yet do you know what I have a feeling that I'm I'm beginning to I've got I've got what I think are are slightly freaky feet so this is why everyone tunes in because I'd like to hear about my slightly freaky toes (laughs) um and so my second toe is longer than my first toe so um I've struggled with those with shoes and ended up putting like those little toe condoms 
There were yeah. no toe condoms in either of those films. Who even knew that you needed yes. toe condoms in your life? Um, but yeah, something's not right with those little toenails. I have a feeling that they're going to start to discolour quite soon as I start ramping up the miles. But you're right. There's no sort of sitting down and thinking, oh, what pen am I going to put myself in? Um, am I going to be able to do this in sub five? I think if I remember rightly, it looked like Brittany was running hers in a sub four, which I thought was pretty she impressive for her first marriage. Normally fit looking people. It was, I mean, obviously they can't create a marathon to film it. So they interwoven different things, which was very cleverly done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the nitty gritty is not there. The bit that annoyed me in Brittany runs a marathon is the morning of the marathon. She woke up and she was looking through her drawers for what she was going to wear. There is not a marathon runner on the planet who does that on the day of a marathon. Everybody has their kit lined up the night before. Most people have taken a photo of it and stuck it on Instagram. But but you 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 have that preparation element. So um, those are the bits that that we all live. And I guess people that feel like they're a runner, somebody who at their heart they self they self identify as a runner might sit and pick a pick away a lot of those elements but if marathon running is not your thing then actually those movies give you the ah this might help me change my life this could be a big achievement and you can get far more swept away in the story yeah absolutely and so Brittany starts with this um information she's given by a doctor that she's trying to get some drugs from basically um some Adderall and she's told she's overweight. I love that line. You, you totally missed the point of those Dove ads. <laughs> oh, bodies are good bodies. Um, so there's a definite, I think, a, a body positivity element to Britney Runs a Marathon, which I do love. Um, but she actually discovers that the gym that she considers joining is just going to be too expensive at $129 a month. And so she decides, well, running is free. And actually, that kind of brings me a little bit onto what you were saying in terms of... Um, kit and trainers and things and actually it is quite expensive running a marathon and this idea that actually it's quite it's okay because it's it's expensive to join a gym but you can just walk out your front door well actually you can and they both actually interestingly start running in converse all stars i noticed um Mm -hmm. but if you get the right shoes and also i think perhaps as you get a bit older you need to pay even more attention to some of these things because my body (laughs) will not let me run in converse all stars not a hope and one of the um, one of the things that stops a lot of women running, particularly from poorer backgrounds, is not having a sports bra. Yeah. And actually, if you've got quite big boobs, that's really, really important. And it is a barrier that you just would not imagine, but can actually be a pretty big barrier. So yeah, you do. If you're going to start running long distances, you need decent trainers. You need decent kit. Then you start getting into the apps that you might have. Then you probably need some headphones so you can listen to something whilst you're running. Then you end up signing up to races and the yeah. virtual ones. And then you start traveling. So I have no idea what we've spent on marathons and Ironmans around the world. It would be horrific. Um, but, but after Brighton, I'm off to do Paris, which is about five weeks later. And so and it's, one of my, it's an amazing experience. It's, it's worth more than money. It's phenomenal um but when you get into that level you're you're paying for Eurostar you're paying for a weekend in a central Paris hotel actually those races London Marathon's phenomenal for being it's about 30 quid to do London Marathon it's amazing but most marathons are probably upwards of 200 Mm. Um, so it does get kind of once you get into it it does start to cost quite a bit yeah Especially then you also have to consider things like the cross training. She joins a gym anyway in the end. So she can be doing that. So she takes quite an extreme approach to health, I think, considering she's training for a marathon. Um, And I think we'll definitely be focusing a little bit on that later. But she comes from this lifestyle of sort of drinking and drugs and cleans up. Um. But what I think is really interesting, she's trying to lose the weight. She's she's trying to live a healthier lifestyle. But actually, especially once she starts running, nobody is judging her nearly as much as she's judging herself. And yes. I think that that's probably what or I certainly relate to. Because every single time I go out running, as you say, you're looking at your numbers and did I do this? Did I do that? And I'm sort of thinking, well, if I want to be able to run 
not that I do, but, you know, a little bit in the back of my mind, it'd be quite nice to get it done in, you know, less than five nights. It'd be nice to get it done before the sweepers start coming around, let's face it. It'd be quite nice to do it in about five and a half hours. So then I have to run at this particular pace. And then you start monitoring how fast you do each of your long runs. And then you start thinking, well, I've just, this is ridiculous. I'm just, I'm getting slower because it seems to be the thing that happens as you increase your distances, you get slower. And there is also, I think, when you very first start running, and Brittany certainly seems to have this at the beginning of the film, just this judgmental nature about herself, about how she looks, how she looks as a runner, about how she looks when she steps out her front door, about how she looks when she's eating a burger. I mean, for goodness sake, I run to eat burgers. So the fact that she berates herself for eating one, it's like, oh no, hun, that's you just did a run. Yeah. It's okay, you can eat a burger. <laughs> but she is judging herself so harshly for not meeting this standard that she set for herself i think there's two points to pick apart there one is that we often tend to see running as a punishment Mm -hmm. so we've heard of schools where if you misbehave or you don't try hard enough you have to run a lap of the playground like oh running should be joyous and we it drives me insane when i look through twitter and it will be around christmas or easter and you have gym chains there's one in particular that's really bad for it. And they will put out how many calories will be in your Christmas dinner and how many miles you need to run to work it off. You're like, you're just missing the point. Running should be a brilliant, fun thing to do. And, and maybe you celebrate that run with something lovely to eat, if that's what you fancy. But you don't use it as punishment because that just gives it that negative connotation in our head. But I also think there is this... What I've noticed is clients coming to me after lockdown who are not necessarily in the sports side. They're much more in the, I want to get into exercise more. And I'm worried about being judged. I am too big to exercise. People will be looking at me saying this, this and this, and particularly kids, actually. So kids who might have done things like football clubs beforehand, they've obviously lost nearly a year of like their clubs and have put on weight because they haven't been doing their normal exercises and they're too embarrassed to go back to their sports and so they're really trying to find ways and we might do that go walk your dog spend loads of time walking the dog because no one judges you walking a dog no one judges you running but we think they do more Mm -hmm. Um, and and finding those baby steps to get back into it until you realize no one's judging we've all got our own stuff going on everyone's way too focused on their own things to worry about what somebody else is doing um but but there is that caveat that sometimes with female runners do get stuff yelled at them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, We can feel unsafe at times. Um, I mean, that didn't come up in the Britney movie, but there is certainly that extra edge of, I know if I've had to run at night, I have to run without headphones on. I have to work out a route that feels much safer. There's a certain route I can't run on near where I live, because there's a guy that sits in his car and shouts things. And and so we do have some of those caveats. It's not being judged, but it is that feeling I have to keep my wits about. Yeah, I think absolutely right. I think that there was a, um, a survey done by Runners World. I think 60% of women have been harassed while running. Yeah. And, and yeah, there is that element of, yeah, certainly if I was out of dark, I wouldn't have certainly wouldn't have both headphones in. I have the bone conducting ones now because then I can know I can hear around me. It it is something that you do have to think about that it would be nice not to have to. Right. Uh, only last week um a piece of research came out of St. Mary's um University in Twickenham and they were looking at runner harassment. And one of the themes that came over was I'm scared of men. And so with all the interviews they'd done, that was what kind of came out that, um, oh, I, I hate the fact we even have to talk about it, but mm. but finding ways for people to feel more comfortable doing it um, will really help more people go and do it. Yeah. And so things like running clubs yeah. are really valuable for that because you get to do it in a safe way and you get to feel more confident when you're with other people. And so running with like a running buddy is brilliant for motivation and for sticking with things and for the accountability of like, I have to be on that corner at seven o'clock in the morning 
because I don't want to leave someone hanging there on their own. Um, but then bigger run clubs too, which came up in Brittany Runs a Marathon. She had two really good running buddies, but then she also had the group. And that really helped to keep the accountability for, I can't go out drinking tonight. I've got my run club in the morning. Um, yeah. but we can use other people to give us that support um, and to feel like we're doing it together. Yeah. And there's some really good online groups for those of us who find the early starts a little bit tricky with running clubs, I'm going to be honest. Um, <laughs> And and some of them haven't been meeting, I'm guessing, as well, under sort of lockdown, although I'm assuming that that's starting up again. But um, And there are some which are really good for specifically for women. Um, Run Mummy Run is yeah. one of the clubs that I'm a member of, and I think that they are just – it's a really nice little community. Um, and also just – when you're doing something like the marathon, what I've liked is the fact that there are the, your groups of the people who are also running the charity race with you or the veterans and you can just kind of yeah. turn to, especially people who've done it before and just ask for some tips or just say, I'm going to do this run tomorrow. In fact, I've done this a couple of times. It's like, well, I've, I've suddenly got to increase my mileage and I've got absolutely no idea where it's safe to run. And I'm thinking safe with cars more than anything else. Yeah. Because not ready yet to start doing the, the the hills of the downs in order to try and get my miles in so where can I go that's long and flat that that doesn't require me just basically going into the sea at this point because I'm, I'm running out of pavement so we then have run fat boy run um where he plans to run a marathon in three weeks yes those ones really annoy me and um, it's very similar I'm um, one of my favourite TV shows, utterly addicted to it over lockdown, uh, it's called The Bold Type. And it's based in New York City and it's three best friends who work in a magazine. And it, it's brilliant. I love it. But they have one episode where um, they're trying to actually highlight trans issues and uh, um, a runner who's who's changed has been unable to run in their new gender. Um, and so they get this runner a place on the Friday before the Sunday marathon. It's like, even if you're a really, really good runner, there are very few people in the world that can literally just rock up with no specific training whatsoever. And certainly if you're starting from scratch and you try and do a marathon in three weeks, you're going to get hurt. There's, yeah. I, I, bought, I mean, running a marathon is not healthy. It's not good for you. So just, no, that's okay um i my, my toenails uh, will attest to that um but also that reminds me of of how it's actually still so recently that women i'm going back to the women's subject women are allowed to run a marathon i absolutely love the fact that there it was believed that we shouldn't run marathons because our uteruses would fall out oh yeah I love that. I know. I know. Actually, several of my friends who'd quite like to run a marathon, if that would be the result, it'd be quite nice to be rid of that with no surgery required. <laughs> yeah, um, and if you ever get a chance to research her, a lady called Catherine Schwitzer is amazing. I got to inter interview her a few years ago. She's so cool. And so she wanted to run Boston, and. Um, her coach said she couldn't until she could run over the distance in training. So she did in training in like jogging bottoms and a track suit that you had in those days. Um, she did over the distance and then she signed up, but used her initials. And because there wasn't, um, because women weren't allowed to do it, there wasn't a box to tick that you were male or female. So um, she didn't lie in any way. Um, but yes, yeah, they tried to wrestle her to the ground mid run to stop her doing it. Um, and she, I think the publicity of that and the fact that people are like, oh, they can do it. Um, she's just such an inspiration that she was like, that's ridiculous. And I'm going off to do it. Um, so, so, yeah, there's some people like her that we really have to be grateful for that people don't no longer believe your uterus will fall out if you run too far. It, it seems ridiculous that, we, that anybody ever thought to even contemplate that we wouldn't be able to do it and yet and I think that it's something that I like about the whole Britney runs a marathon thing is that this is a female running a marathon as opposed to you know run fat by run it's a man running a marathon and I think that there is something in that just in terms of female empowerment and I'm thinking about her very first run that she does and and actually they both have something quite similar with this that very first run that they just can't do 
because it's the very first time they step out. In fact, Brittany leaves the house and then goes straight back in. She doesn't even run the first time because yeah. she catches sight of herself in the uh, hot dog. It's a reflection. powerful moment, yeah. Yeah. And again, this is this is her, her judging herself. But the first time she tries to reach the end of her block and that road just, just elongates in front of her. And I think with Run Fat Boy Run, Simon Pegg's character doesn't even get to the end of the road before he has cramp and a wedgie because he's running in swimming shorts. <laughs> <laughs> but there's definitely something about that feeling of the end just moving away. I swear on my last couple of long runs, I was running backwards by the end of it. I just like, how, how, am, I, how am I not moving forward faster? My legs don't seem to be going as fast as... I'm telling them to. And I wonder about that, the impact of that psychologically, that feeling that you're just not getting faster or the end is getting further away and it's just getting harder from that very first run when you're doing marathon training. A lot of what we'll work with athletes on is technical brace yourself. So exactly the same as if, you are sitting on an aeroplane when we used to go on things like aeroplanes. <laughs> and they say, if, if something goes wrong, you need to brace yourself. You need to almost protect yourself and expect this is going to be hard. Because nobody runs a marathon without going through some tough times. Guaranteed, you will. Um, and I often work with athletes on their circadian rhythms. Because when you know that every hour and a half, you're going to have a really big dip, you are going to have at least a really big dip during a marathon because everyone takes at least two hours to do it. Most of us take at least double that. So you're going to have two big dips in it. And so it really helps get your head around. It's supposed to be really difficult. You are supposed to struggle in it. Nobody runs it and bounces the whole way through. Because actually, the more you do, and hopefully the faster you get, it's still just as hard mm -hmm. going faster. Um, but the idea of really bracing yourself, this is going to be tough. And that's okay. It's going to be tough. I'm accepting that I'm worried about it. I'm accepting it's going to be tough. But it matters more to me that I do it. Um, and I, in my psychology practice, I use an awful lot of acceptance and commitment theory. And it just, it works so beautifully for this kind of thing about rather than, than building ourselves up with all those fears and those worries and setting off a threat response in our body, which then means we struggle to run. So with that threat response, your heart rates up, your breathing rates up, your stomach feels nauseous, your shoulders are tight, you lose your peripheral vision. None of that's great for being an athlete. But really unhelpful when you're, you're trying to have nice, flowing, easy running. So we absolutely want to get people out of that threat zone. And when it feels too big and too scary, that's where we'll be. But if we can really go, yeah, it's going to be tough. It's supposed to be tough. That's why you're doing it. You're trying to make a point. You're trying to change. You're trying to do something hard. So, so let's accept that that's where we are. But let's really look at why we want to do this. And that then helps with that motivation. And one of the loveliest things I saw from London Marathon a few years ago was a lady that was fundraising for a domestic violence shelter. And she had written 26 names of women in that shelter that would benefit from her fundraising. And every time she went through a mile marker, she'd look at the name of a woman matched to that mile and think about her. And so that motivation was way more than the pain and the struggle and the feeling everything felt like it was never going to end. Mm -hmm. and so she was able to get through it. And so I think marathons are like the best, best way to practice motivation and mantra because we've got time to practice. We're out there for a long time. We're out there training for a really long time. So um, the more we can build in those things that really helps. Um, another technique we tend to use a lot is chunking. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that, just in terms of, I just noticed that's one of the things that Brittany does, is she starts by going, just, just the block, just going to run yeah. around the block. Yeah, yeah. And I've certainly found myself going, we're just going to focus on the next mile. 
where's yes. the next mile going to take me to? And I've realised with the training my coach sets me, I probably struggle more on a 45 minute easy run because it's 45 minutes of stuff than I do on a treadmill session I had today that was eight sets of three minutes hard and three minutes easy because it's that's very neatly chunked down into um 16 sessions 16 bits yeah. and you can get through three minutes it's harder I worked far harder today than I did on the easy run yesterday but it's because it's nicely chunked down that really helps so for marathon runners we'd be really clear yes it's 26 miles the two matters too, 26.2 miles. But actually, it's eight and a half park runs. Yeah. And you can do eight and a half. You can do a park run without thinking about it. You'll have done many, many of those in your build-up. You'll know the park run route where you are, if that's your thing. So, so you pick a goal for each of those park runs. And the first one might be settling into a nice rhythm. The second one might be taking my first gel. The third one might be looking for supporters in the crowd. And I love that Brittany Runs the Marathon showed that element of it because where she was at her lowest and where she was just about to come off the, the route, she saw her supporters and they pulled her through. And whilst it makes for a lovely, cheesy element in a movie, it works in real life too. I have been told this, absolutely. And and actually, I think it does in Run Fat by Run when he hits the wall. Um he visualizes charging through it, which I loved. I like that idea. I like the fact the wall is physical. Like he actually sees the wall, and I can imagine that. Um, and I'm told this that you know, if I can, if I can run 20 miles, then the crowd will pull me through the That's remainder, it. and it's going to be yeah. okay. And actually, I really felt for the people I saw in lockdown running the virtual London marathon. We actually went out. It was horrible out there in Brighton that day. It was, it was wet, and nasty, and we were out there cheering on anybody that oh, we could see you. because it's like you need the people you need somebody to just push you through sometimes yeah so I did I did London virtually in London and I actually ran to Tower Bridge and back because that was it worked out a perfect distance route from where I live and seeing people cheering each other on and I probably saw about another 50 60 marathon runners that day those bits were the people that got you through mm. um, so one of the things that marathons will give you is put your name on your vest. Yes. Absolutely do it. Because, yes, it really matters to see your own supporters. But actually hearing your own name called out is really nice too. Um, so if there's, if there's one piece of advice I give to any marathon runner on the kind of how to keep your, your mind positive as you do it, your name on your vest, feeling like people are rooting for you is brilliant. And then there's a really lovely piece of research from I can't remember the uni. They um, quite possibly Northern Ireland. There's a brilliant researcher in running called Noel Brick and some, some really interesting studies. And they got treadmill runners to smile at certain points. And smiling reduces the perception of effort that you feel you're putting in. And somehow it improves your running efficiency too. Um, and you do better. And then there's an extra element of this that an, another university did where they put cyclists on indoor turbo trainers and they flashed up far too quickly for them to notice. But while they were doing it, they flashed up pictures of faces and they either got smiley faces or they got frowning faces. And the smiley face people were able to go 16% longer than the frowners. And I think you can use this beautifully in a marathon because if you smile, and we often use the mantra, smile every mile, you go through the miles, I only smile. That means the people in the audience, the supporters, they smile back at you. And you kind of get that double win. So, so it feels really hard. And at 20 miles, the last thing you want to do is smile. But if you can, it's really helpful. And that's why big city marathons can be so good. Because mm -hmm. I remember running through parts of London I probably wouldn't normally go to. I might feel a bit afraid going there. And yet there were just thousands of people on the streets handing out jelly babies, high-fiving, brilliant bands playing. All of that makes you smile. And that makes it feel just that little bit easier. And so that hitting the wall, is it 
I've, I've heard a lot of different theories that, that it's not a thing. It's only a thing if you think it's a thing. Um, is it physical? Is it psychological? Is it a bit of both? Is that what we're saying? So from physiology, what I understand is that, yes, we do run out of glycogen at a certain point. Um, and what we're trying to do with things like taking gels is delay that point. Um, but I think it's been talked about and it's known about so much that it's also a psychological thing now. We kind of expect it at 20 miles. Hmm. Whereas actually most people seem to, that I've worked with tend to go through a bit earlier than that. And they'll go through at 17, 18. Um, and yeah, you will definitely, definitely have a tough time at some point fairly late in the race. And it doesn't tend to be too close to the end because actually once you know you've only got six, seven K to go, we know we can do that. And it's almost like, okay, I could walk this bit if I had to, I can do it. Um, so it does tend to be about that time when we have tough times. And when I'm working with athletes running, we will prepare for that. We'll have like things they can pull out of their back pocket to reduce the perception of effort. And that's why things like very powerful mantras that you use at that point are so helpful. Um, a really cute trick we use is getting friends and people you love to write messages on stickers and you stick them on your gels so okay. when you pull a gel out of your pocket to take it you've got a message from somebody that loves you i used that for the virtual london marathon and it was brilliant because i was literally it was seven o'clock in the morning i had run through every puddle in london every element of me was soaked and i wasn't really enjoying the the audio book I was listening to, but I couldn't work out how to change it while still running. And you have all of this stuff going on. Um, and I'd taken one drink with me, but then I couldn't find a supermarket that was open at that time on a Sunday morning in a pandemic to get another drink. And you have all of these things kind of making it tricky. And then you pull out a gel and I've got a message my four-year-old had written for me. And it, it was something simple. I love you, mummy. But that kind of goes, okay, now I can't let her down. Can't get the tube home, can I? So, so those kind of things we have as, as things to kind of know when it gets tough, you've got that. Okay. Um, sometimes we'll strategically place your supporter at certain points. So it's like, yeah, have somebody at 20 miles so that you're looking out for them in the crowd. You're focused on them, not on how much your feet hurt or whatever else, everything hurts, how tight your hips are, all of this stuff. Um, the more of those you can throw in and prep for it the less you dread it and actually the easier it is okay that makes sense and I think there's something about that kind of breaking things up that you were talking about before that I I Jeff so for those who don't know Jeffing um is created by Jeff Galloway or at the very least we're not created but that's where the, the Jeffing bit comes from and it's a run walk run method so rather than having to do a flat pace no stopping you're running the whole way you run for a certain amount of time and then you have a walk break and then you run again um, it's not just a case of start stopping which is really important to know because that would cause injuries so there's a lot in the training about learning to glide gliding in and out of your run stages and for somebody like myself who is feeling the years and um, a little prone to injury that it's theoretically meant to help prevent quite a few of those injuries um, and it works it works really really well but actually it also helps to chunk so it's you're breaking things up a little bit because actually you're running for the last run I did was 30 seconds running 30 seconds walking although it's normally 90 seconds 30 and people just you find a ratio that works for you but as you said before when you were saying that you were doing your treadmill run you can run for three minutes and it, it's okay you can do that and you certainly can run for 30 seconds and then yeah. you can walk and then you can run again and then you can walk the only difficulty I have is that my worry is that the spectators will see me stopping to walk and will think that I'm giving up <laughs> so I'm seriously thinking of putting something in my back that say you know this this vehicle makes frequent stops or something similar that oh, we would actually be stopping. Yes. I, I remember a London marathon I did where I was going into it knowing I had um, a bit of an injury. I've got a, a curved spine and that tends to mean my body doesn't really like running. 
Um, and so bits will get very tight at certain times. And I got to um, Canary Wharf. So you're about 17, 18 miles there. And I just needed to stretch. And I was like, if I can just stretch my hip out for a couple of minutes, I'll be fine. I can carry on. But it was like six deep of people going, don't stop, don't stop. And I'm like, no, no, it's okay. I'm not stopping. I just need to stretch. But you're like all of that telling people took over so much stress. You're like, oh, it'll be easier just to run. And it was like, well, maybe I'll try and run until there's nobody watching. The London Marathon, there is nowhere that nobody's watching. So it was really stressful because you're like, oh, I don't want to let people down. And it's lovely they're cheering me on. But this is purposeful. This is going to help. Yeah. And I think that's um, something that the the run, walk, run side of things, the jeffing I, I have at the back of my mind is is moving to the side, making sure somebody behind me doesn't hit me. It just kind of gives you one more thing to think about. Yeah. So you don't want people running into the back of you because you've suddenly that slowed down and they were assuming you were going to keep the pace. But I think talking about that in terms of, for me, jeffing is, is a way of protecting my body and you feeling the need that you were going to need to walk. We saw in both of those films, Britney Runs a Marathon and Run Fat by Run, they both run through their injuries. And I think with Brittany, as you say, stress fracture, they they happen. And she's told she should listen to her body better <laughs> and not yeah. do that. But I can see how hard that is because actually it's one of those things, as you say, marathons hurt, training hurts. And it's really hard to know, is this normal pain or is this abnormal pain that I should be stopping and doing something about? And if you then end up adding physiotherapy onto your list of ever-growing expenses for your marathon, then this really does start to be unachievable for a lot of people. How do you know? It's really, really tricky. Um, And they're the sessions I do with athletes where there are a lot of tears because injury not only stops you doing what you love it also stops you doing what is usually a very good coping mechanism for all the other stresses in your life so the people I feel for most are professional athletes because we we might get stressed with things and we sign up and we do exercise as a way of handling that but professionals the exercise that they're using to handle as a coping mechanism for stress suddenly becomes an additional stress because you've got to be good at it. You've got to earn money. You've got to get sponsorship. You've got to win stuff. Um, and then you get injured. And that's really frustrating because they do see their competitors who are going after the same sponsorship deals or anything else. Looks like they're flying ahead of them. So injury is a really tough one. And there are some tough conversations to be had about when you might run through injury. Because if you have trained for six months and that's your only race and it's a big championships and you don't have to do anything afterwards, sometimes somebody might run through an injury that might happen in a race and kind of go, yeah, I've got to get to the end. And they will. They will be very broken at the end of that. But that was a very purposeful decision made in that moment. And they might well have discussed it beforehand. But for 99.9% of us, there will be another race. Hmm. And actually, if you spend your life injured and you've got no consistency in your running, you tend to fall out of love with it a lot more. Um, So I try to get athletes to think about the difference between discomfort and pain. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we are running, we should feel uncomfortable. If you're doing an interval session... Or if you're getting to the end of a long run, it will feel uncomfortable. You've put your body through something it's not really designed to do. And so discomfort is okay. Almost actually, we can praise ourselves when we've had some discomfort and we've coped with it. Because that's what we were setting out to do. Pain is different. And so that listen to your body bit is really important about learning different parts of your body and how they feel. And there's a really brilliant um, sports writer, researcher called Alex Hutchinson. He's got an amazing book out called Endure that I just wish I'd written it because it's so good. Um, And one of the the points he makes in it, he goes out to discover why he's had two amazing races in his life and why 
why was why weren't those consistent why was he able to do those two what was it that made those amazing and the rest has never quite got to that level and so he goes out and he interviews the best people in the world about it and in his section on injury he talks about pain is information often we might feel a tiny bit of pain and we would instantly react i must stop something's wrong and we're on that threat zone very very quickly whereas Actually, sometimes it might be telling you your technique's not very good or you're running on a surface that's not brilliant for you or you've been overusing this recently. So it's actually sometimes a very helpful thing. And when we can switch and kind of see pain rather than a threat response, but pain as a, oh, okay, this is information. What information can I take from this? Then we can respond to it very differently. And that information might be, Go and see a physio really quickly and get this looked at. It might be take a couple of rest days. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you have, if you work with a coach or somebody that knows what they're doing, that can be very helpful. A few months ago, I had a pain in my foot and I had to get the bus home from my run because there was no way I was going to be able to run it. And I could message my coach and say, Annie, I've got a pain. And she's like, right, get a pen, draw on your foot where the pain is. And what it's doing to you. And I could explain that. And she's like, right, it sounds like your plantar fasciitis is playing up. Get a drinks bottle, fill it with water, stick it in the freezer. And every couple of hours, roll your foot on it. And no running for the rest of this week. And that was all it took. And then it's fine. And I haven't had, touch wood, haven't had an issue with it since. Um, So sometimes reacting very quickly of like, oh, that's not right. is really good. But other times I did a horrible treadmill session today. And it was so uncomfortable, but it was supposed to be. Yeah. And so that learning your body is really important. Yeah. I find it really interesting. There's um, a friend of mine who started running, I was going to say just for fun. I mean, really just for fun. She just one foot in front of the other and just saw how far she could go. She ended up doing a marathon just just for fun. You know, (laughs) not actually even as a race, just that's the distance she decided to run that day. But she was saying that with her, when she feels discomfort, she kind of leans into it. And I tried that in one of my runs. Um, And again, I think I'm with you. There are some things that, you know, oh, uh oh, that's not going to be okay. That's a problem versus, oh, twingy hip. And there's something I found about just kind of leaning into it, not trying to push it away, not trying to ignore it, but just going, okay, hi there. (laughs) Thanks for letting me know that you're around. And then waiting for it to go, because actually a lot of the time it just does. And really that was does. the realisation. It was amazing. It's like, hang on, I thought that that was a problem. Instead, as you say, it's just information. It was just my yeah. hip going, yep, didn't like that last you know, mile. <laughs> Ease I, off I, a bit or whatever. I think that's one of the reasons I love acceptance and commitment theory when you're working in this area, because it is listening to your body. I go, okay, thanks for the info. Okay, you're not a happy hip today. Okay, that's probably telling me I need to do some more Pilates. But I'll finish this one first and then I'll do 20 minutes when I get home. And so it's, you're listening and you're having that conversation with that part of your brain, but it's not, oh my God, this is this is it. This is the end of the world. I'm not going to be able to run the marathon. And, and all of those thoughts when we tend to get kind of quite ruminating and going off on one about them. Yeah. And we touched there on, the mental health and running side of things and how difficult it is when you are then sort of benched basically especially if it's something that you you do for a living but certainly that's something in Brittany runs a marathon she really struggles with where she's trying to transform her body as well as trying to do the marathon and she's changing her diet which I still feel was a lot to be trying to do all at the same time and she has this whole, I'm making a whole new Brittany. I think that's her phrase. And there was something about the fact she then couldn't run because of her stress fracture. And she had that real fear of the weight's going to come back on and nobody's going to like me because my weight will come back on. So there was a lot of that kind of critiquing, really low self-esteem stuff. There was something there, I think, about wanting to be less than you are. And I think that that's such a huge thing again it's it's part of the industry where you have to make up for eating something by running 
And there's also that message that we should be less. And I do, again, believe that that is directed more at women than at men. Oh, and it's 100%. <laughs> this idea that we should take up less space. We should be thinner. We should be svelte. We shouldn't have boobs that require two bras um, to run in, which hopefully, by the way, if you have a really good bra, you shouldn't need two of them. Um, have a Google. But generally, there is this idea that we should be less. And what I've loved, I used before I was doing the marathon training before lockdown, and I was doing the obstacle races. I was doing a lot more weight training. And one of the things I loved about weight training is it's about being more. It's about, you know, I want to be more than I am. I want to lift more. I want to take up more space, actually. I want my muscles to take up more space. And I think there's something there about this kind of marathon running as well that that I hope that that's where Brittany ended up when she kind of came out the other end of that cycle that she was in, where actually being able to run a marathon in itself is the goal. You are more because your body can do stuff. You celebrate your body for what it can do, not for the size it is. Yes, definitely. Um, and I would love if, if I could ever sit and get hold of all those forms you have to fill in when you join up to a gym and it says, why are you joining up to the gym? I would love to analyse them by sex of the women saying, yeah, I want to lose weight. I want to be smaller. I want to be thinner. I want to be tinier. And, and the male version would be, I want to be stronger. I want to be bigger. Um, and from the research I've done in this area, it, it's been there for a very, very, very long time. Um, and actually, really interestingly, I had um, a horrible experience a few weeks ago. I was swimming and um, there was a guy in the fast lane who was much slower than me. And when I tumble turned, he grabbed hold of my ankle. So I was held underwater. And um, I, I tweeted about it and had hundreds of messages from people kind of going, oh, my God, I've had something similar or those kind of things. Um, but what really struck me was um, a researcher who reached out to me and we were talking about these kind of things. And I was like, Can, do you know why this tends to happen? And, and really looking into this kind of aggression towards women. And she said from she's got a book coming out next year on it. She said when she's looked into it, there are certain periods of time when men feel like women are taking over too much. And so they're, they're trying to take something back. And we've got decent jobs now. We've shown we've got decent brains. The only area that's left is physicality. And so that aggression can kind of come across in that way. And so I would love us to be able to change that conversation about not how do we be less. And I could feel myself the next time I got in the swimming pool, the guy was banned. So I knew I was safe, but I was so careful. I slowed down. I was less than who I normally am the next day because mm -hmm. I didn't want to upset somebody. I didn't want to risk that. And I don't want to be that person. I want us to go out and go, we're brilliant at this stuff. Let's do more of it. Let's be more. Let's be bigger. Let's be stronger. And, and yeah, so I am hoping that kind of, I don't know, if this Britney runs a, an ultra marathon movie comes out, it's about how she got stronger and she didn't want to be less. She was, she was happy with the strength that she'd got and the speed that she could develop. Because actually we know a lot of my work is with people who've got disordered eating or exercise addiction. And that often comes down to that. I have to be less. Um, and we know that absolutely when you lose some weight to run, you run faster. Yeah. That becomes very addictive. But there will be a moment in which you break and then you can't run at all. Um, and so it is a, a real area to, for all sorts of mental health reasons, that trying to keep us away from wanting to be less is really important. It should be about strength. Yeah, absolutely. For, for everybody. And I see it, I think, possibly more in the gym perhaps it's about the gyms I go to or did go to before lockdown and everything where I do remember that moment I was following there's um somebody called Nia Shanks who does um something called lift like a girl and this is uh, her big message is is have a goal 
but have a goal that is about being able to do something. So yes. one year it was, I, I want to master pull-ups. I, I did. I, I could do three. I put, I can't do them now, Amazing. but I could. So I could do it. And then it was, you know, handstand shoulder presses. And it's all about just leveling up each time because we do love to level up, don't we, as human beings generally. Yeah. And I like the idea that, that marathon running can do that without it having to be stopping everything so if you look at sort of run fat boy run he he's drinking eggs at one point what is he even drinking eggs for but she certainly stops drinking and stops eating pizzas and there's something about those whole life changes that did make me wonder is that helpful or is it hindering because it's not just I'm going to run a marathon it's I'm going to change everything about myself and run a marathon is that a bit much for most people yeah and I don't think that's very realistic to be honest um and I think it's actually quite rare that somebody sits there we kind of imagine they're in the pub they've all been drinking and somebody goes yes I'm gonna run the marathon um it's just sometimes we will see that if if there's a very specific charity that you really want to fundraise towards then it might be okay I need to do something big and you might sign up but most people tend to work towards it. So it's actually, they will start off by saying, I am never running a marathon. That looks completely ridiculous. Why on earth would I do that? Like, no chance. And then they do a 5K and they're like, oh, well, I managed that. And I guess like Brittany did, she did the 5K um, and, and felt good. And, and then it's a 10K. And then it's a half marathon. But actually, from what I've seen in my running club, that's a process over quite a few years. It is it is really rare that someone does the whole, yes, I'm going to run a marathon and suddenly I'm training for it. So the process, by the time you run the marathon, you might have been off drink. I mean, I stopped for a week before. I, I, this is definitely not properly stopping. Um, so you might not have had a drink for a week. And yes, you might have focused a little more on your diet. But to be honest you usually can get away with eating far less healthy when you're doing marathon training and people kind of make the most of that. Um, so you, you will be changing your lifestyle, but it's a long, slow process and it's kind of baby steps and not necessarily purposeful ones. You kind of just find yourself doing it or you're meeting new people through your running. So you're doing different behaviors with them. Mm -hmm. So in Brittany, she was, taking it look like quite a lot of drugs at certain points of it um so it's not like you'd suddenly overnight no I'm not doing that anymore but it's suddenly that actually your social life would change mm -hmm. and you're not going clubbing but you might be going for drinks after running on a Wednesday night and so that might involve a shandy rather than cocaine and so it, it gradually changes and you're saying there about that that gradual build-up and I was that I, I was that person why why does why do run a marathon and there's a, there's a one of my favorite memes is um just just a science do, do people who run marathons know that they don't have to yes. <laughs> <laughs> i get that um and yet i did 10k under lockdown which i've done 10ks before training for one of the wolf runs that i did but then i did just 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 running around the block of flats that i live in because i'm in the vulnerable group so i was just running around and around and around the flats it's not a big block I had to keep changing direction because I thought one leg was going to get bigger than the other. <laughs> but then I did earlier this year a half. Did the yeah. it was a, it was the the Paris the virtual Paris half, and then I said, well, if I can do that, I may as well do a marathon. And one of the things that 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 I think my friends and family are a little nervous of is that I've now started watching a lot of ultra marathon documentaries ah. because I feel that if people can run an ultra marathon then I can definitely run a marathon so I'm looking at the marathon de sable and you know some of these amazing documentaries out there about these people who just just keep going and it does make me a little concerned that this is addictive that that once you've done one marathon, there will be that. Okay, well, can I can I can I be in the hundred marathon club, or could I maybe do an ultra, or what about a triathlon, and what about an Ironman? Is that is that what you tend to see that it just keeps going? Yeah. So so I struggle with using the word addictive because I work a lot with people with genuine exercise addiction. Yeah. And so 
that feels very different. Yeah. But there is something very sticky about marathons and the feeling of having done it and the excitement in the build up and the different stuff you get to do and the places you can see. Um, and then there is always that, if you're a thriving sort of person, there is always the, oh, what, what else could I manage? What else is out there? And so it might not be a, a full on MDS straight away, Marathon to Sabla, but it might be a, oh, there's a 50K. And that's not that much further. <laughs> and then you go to one and there is something about the ultra marathon community. It's just, they're utterly joyous people. So my husband's done some ultras. And so I've had to stand around by the side of the road for six hours waiting for him. Um, everyone's just lovely and welcoming. And my husband said on his first, he was up with the front guys who I think he came fourth in it. And so he was worried. They'd be like, who's this imposter that's turned up and running with us? And he was like, they were so lovely. They looked after me. They gave me loads of advice and guidance. They told me what backpacks were good. They told me how to fill up with jelly babies at certain points. It was just like the most positive experience. And often it's not about time with ultras. It's about the experience and where you get to see. So actually some of the slowest runners I know are the people that do ultras because you can run, walk lots of it. You can walk tons of it. It's not about how fast you are. It's about that community. And there is something, I think maybe that's one of the really powerful drives. Something we work a lot in, in sport and exercise psychology is around self-determination theory and really looking at getting intrinsic motivation. And you've got the mastery side, which will come from doing lots of training. And you've got the autonomy side from picking what you do. But that sense of belonging in that community is so powerful. And so we talked about it earlier on when she, Brittany runs a marathon, joins a running club. Um, you're talking about kind of run mummy run groups. They give you that community. And I think they were so important to people over lockdown where we didn't have our normal groups to go out to. They kept everybody going. And the virtual runs do the same thing. Yeah. But there's something magnetic about ultra runners and ultra running and that community and it, it really amplified it for me there's um there's a couple of guys in this country that do some really really crazy distances and one of them um, or two of them as we came out of lockdown this time last year decided to take on something called the Pennine Way and it's 268 miles from I think almost the top of Scotland down to midway through the country and uh, they did it a week apart. So the first guy, John Kelly, did it and he achieved it and he broke the record. And then a week later, Damien Hall did it the other direction and um, he broke the record by three hours. And so this poor guy that had been training for it broke the record and he only kept the record for a week. Um, but, but what was just so lovely was that there was no nasty rivalry whatsoever what I really loved was actually John Kelly whose record was about to be broken spent the time that Damien was doing his run which was about two and a half days I think non-stop um tweeting out all of the environmental stuff that Damien would normally tweet because Damien's full on into really um strong on environmental elements and so he spent the time tweeting out things so that his followers would learn new things about environment and how we can help in certain ways so that he could kind of do Damien's good work whilst Damien was off trying to break his record. And, and every time you see somebody's gone off to do a run, all of their competitors come and help them out. They come and pace them. It's just this really special, lovely world. Hmm. But, yeah, it's very compelling. Yeah, I can see that. And it very much goes down to that. It's not the time you do, it's the time you have which kind of oh, seems to go oh, down I love that the... quote. Yeah. It's from from your 5K run all the way through to your ultra. It's about that. It's about not losing sight of why you did it in the first place, which was because you just wanted to do it and have some fun. Yeah. yeah. Or, and that might not be your purpose. Um, I've got a book coming out in a month, actually a month today, 
And it's about the 10 pillars of success. And so it picks off different kind of characteristics that we can develop. Um, and each chapter interviews somebody that really embodies that. And Damien Hall, one of, his runners, one of these runners, was my purpose chapter. And talking about the absolute power of purpose. And when you know what yours is, you can achieve things far greater than you thought you could. And he really talks about one of the reasons he could achieve what he did was because he absolutely knew his purpose was about finding a better, leaving a better world for the future. And it was about his kids and it was about the environment. And he even had written on his arm, FFF. And it was in massive block capitals. Everyone's like, what does that stand for? And he was like, friends, family, future. So every time he could look down, that was his purpose. And that gives him the, my legs don't work, nothing works, I'm exhausted, I haven't slept for two days, I've run nonstop. Those were the bits that kept him going, was having, knowing his reason why. And so when we know our reasons why to do it, it, it makes it a little bit easier. Absolutely, that's great. That feels like a really good point to finish on. Thank you very much for joining me today. And this has been absolutely fascinating and incredibly helpful. I'm definitely going to be taking on some of your tips for my, well, my next long run, certainly, but certainly on the marathon day itself. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll see you at Brighton. Brilliant. Thank you. You've been listening to Analyze This, mental health and film and TV. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. My guest was Dr. Josephine Perry, and we were discussing the films Run Fat Boy Run and Britney Runs a Marathon, but mainly we were talking about running. Dr. Perry's books can be found on Amazon. She also writes for The Times and Cycling Weekly. Her website is performanceinmind.co.uk. I'm running the Brighton Marathon for the charity Mind. And if you want to donate to my Just Giving page, search for me at Dr. Boo on Just Giving, or check out the links in the comments section. Music of this episode was by Joseph McDade and post-production editing by David Woods. Thank you for listening. Please visit me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm there as The Dr Boo. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, and any thoughts you have about future episodes, opinions on episodes we already have. Spread the word, tell your friends and colleagues about my podcast, and please don't forget to subscribe, like, rate, and review.